Welcome, guys, to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, the most Willoughby can, and on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of limitations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of independence, we go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to actually get the order to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do here how the frack we got here. Thanks for listening and um, hold on. It's gonna be fun. All right, guys. Today's date, November 22nd, 2023, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm most the most will be can on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense of it all. Uh, before we get started, guys, let you know that we are a news podcast, which means that we too try to get our sources of news, the most credible news sources that have award-winning journalism. We do not do sensational news like Fox News or Newsmax or The Blaze, wherever you get your extreme left or right news from. We simply give you just the facts, as well as we do try to maintain our language because, hey, sometimes words do fly. At the same time, there may be things that might be shown that might be too graphic for younger viewers, so viewer discretion is advised. So, aside from that, welcome. So, on this beloved Before the Turkey Day, Before the Turkey Day, folks, um, well, we do got a little bit of news, and we might as well start off with the one that everybody's talking about. Um, the ceasefire that's happening between Israel and Palestine. In the fighting for Thanksgiving morning, Hamas is saying just in the past few hours that the pause will begin at 10 a.m. tomorrow. The Israeli government keeping the Biden administration waiting for nine hours of talks before finally making the announcement. President Biden welcoming the statement, saying the First Lady Jill and I have been keeping all those held hostage and their loved ones close to our hearts. Coming home, around 50 of the women and children taken in the October 7th terror attacks. Three Americans are expected to be released in the first group, a senior administration official says, including three-year-old Abigail Moridan, her family hoping she'll be home for her birthday on Friday. She's turning four, and to like just imagine that she comes home and is with her family is, is, the, is our light right now in, in such a very dark and terribly, terribly horrific period. Here in Israel, urgent phone calls to families. The mother of 21-year-old Mia Sham, last seen in a Hamas propaganda video almost five weeks ago, praying she'll soon see her daughter in person. How, how are you feeling this morning, Karen? Mm, shaking. Since the, the moment I woke up. Um, you know, it's like a Russian roulette. We are waiting to see, to see who will come back home. President Biden thanking mediators in Qatar and Egypt and Israel's prime minister, who pushed through the deal in a tense government meeting where he insisted a brief truce would not end the war. And just yesterday, fierce fighting, 250 airstrikes, Israel says, ahead of the initial four-day humanitarian pause starting tomorrow. In exchange for 50 hostages, 150 Palestinian prisoners, including some women and teenagers, will be released by Israel. The Red Cross will be given access to the hostages still held, while humanitarian aid will get to the people of Gaza, three to 400 trucks a day and fuel. The biggest diplomatic breakthrough since 1,200 were murdered on October 7th. And according to the Hamas-run health ministry, more than 14,000 killed in Gaza. And this morning, so many hostage families hoping the agreement holds. Have you allowed yourself to think about what you might say to her the first time you see her? I don't think I will speak. I will just hold her and hug her and, and I just want to hold her. And Savannah, we've just been able to look through the list of Palestinians who may be released. They are mainly men accused or convicted of a range of offences, including throwing stones to terror offences like attempted murder or creating explosives. Savannah, if this deal holds, there could be more days of pauses. And on each day, we're told 10 more hostages could be released. Savannah? So... Um, currently, as it stands right now, yes, there is a ceasefire put in place that hostages are going to be released. And I know for a lot of us, and I and I stress this very heavily, I know for a lot of us, especially in the African-American community, it is a little difficult for us to care about what's going on um, 
really in the Middle East. It's difficult for us um, just because, yes, there is some misconstitution. There is some a lot of misinformation out there, number one. I keep stressing that very heavily. If you don't know what's going on, I highly, I highly, highly, highly recommend to definitely check out the history between Israel, between Israelites, Palestinians, and Hamas. I cannot stress that enough because, yes, there is a little bit of a problem. If you see people that are on social media that are trying to basically like the way exactly saying, wait a minute, this is not the one-sided war you think it is, then yes, that's the whole reason of looking into this. Um, but I keep on saying is, as long as we're involved, the war itself will continue. But we will try to keep tabs on that as best we can. It's just that, again, it's it's not black and white. That's that's about, about that's actually about the best way I can say it. That it's not black and white. That there are facts out there that really should be reported on, especially on the Israel side, um, because they're not so not the victims they all claim to be. Just saying. But other things uh, move right along. Like I said, we're on this pre-Turkey Day, and it is amazing to me that you know in the world of journalism, you kind of get days where they get the slow news days, like. It's a like, for example, the next story I'm about to play. America's living paycheck to paycheck. I think we can follow this under no shit, Sherlock. Back well, with Thanksgiving almost here and holiday shopping already underway, Americans say they're feeling the pressure financially. That is according to a new report by the Lending Club. That's a financial services company. It found 60% of adults say they are living paycheck to paycheck heading into the holidays. Let's bring in Caleb Silver for more on this, our friend and editor-in-chief at Investopedia. Caleb, good morning. Always great to have you with us. So hearing that number, 60% living paycheck to paycheck, also kind of the inverse of that stat is 4 in 10 consumers consider themselves worse off than last year. Uh, with inflation cooling, or at least we've kind of started to see that, and interest rates at least a pause in the hikes, does it surprise you to hear stats like that? Yeah, because money has gotten more expensive over the last year and a half through all these interest rate hikes. So it's credit card debt, mm. it's rent. Rent has gone up month after month. Food prices are still high. They've come down just a little bit, or at least they've stopped accelerating. So all the necessities, think about it, about a third of our paychecks usually go to housing. With rents rising, mortgage rates rising, that's now a little bit more than a third. That puts stress on everything else. And as you go into this holiday season where we're expected to buy mm. and people feel that stress because they feel the pressure to spend money on loved ones when, in fact, they don't have to. But it is a thing we get right. ourselves into every <laughs> single season. So consumer spending is such a driver of the economy. Does understanding that people are living this way and how that may make them react over the next few months into the holiday season uh, – say anything about the overall health of the economy? Yeah, I mean, if consumers pull back on spending, that is 70% of GDP. Mm. So that could slow down the economy. That said, consumers rarely pull back on spending. And a big deal that's happened in the last couple of months, gas prices are way down. Mm. Gas prices is that psychological thing people see that makes them pull back on spending in other places, even though rent and food prices are high too. So what we know so far about how people may spend. A little bit of it we're getting from this uh, Deloitte survey. It found that spending this week is expected to jump 13%. Shoppers expected to spend an average of $567 as they're doing that holiday shopping you're talking about for family members, for friends. What impact could that have on families that are already feeling strapped for cash? I mean, do you are you concerned about people being able to afford these expenses and then what it ultimately means for credit card debt? Yeah, well, they're just going to pile it onto their credit card debt. And a lot of people in that survey also said only 23 percent said they plan to pay it off. So mm -hmm. people overspending without a plan to pay it off. That's never a good thing. And we also hear these reports and we see it out in Investopedia. People looking how to tap their savings, how to tap their 401k to get some extra cash. That is a no, no, my friend. You can't be doing that, especially around the holiday season. Give us more tips, maybe some more no-nos. Yeah. How should we budget? Well, the yes yeses are have a plan, <laughs> stick to it. Have that number in mind and challenge yourself to come in or below that number when you're spending yes, comparison yes. shop. You know, you can always get a better deal. Every time you look at something, whether it's off of Instagram or anywhere else, you get that discount code, use it, but also comparison shop. You can get better deals. We also talk about these online coupons and store deals you see out there. Use those and rewards cards. Get paid to shop by earning rewards or use your rewards from mm. prior shopping to buy your gifts. That's a great way to not spend that extra money because you already earned it. Great tips. Thanks for the yes, yes. So this was so crazy that we literally just saw a report that said that 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And the nearest thing they talk about is how to save money. Let's think about this for a second. 
we just saw a report that said 60% of Americans are now living paycheck to paycheck. And we're not asking the grand question that why is that? Why is the fact that, it, of course, you guys, you guys hear me say this all the time on the show. Well, you know, especially at the end, I say everything goes up for your paycheck. Why are we not discussing income? And again, this is one of those things you think on Capitol Hill they would discuss. Why are we not discussing people's income? Why are we not discussing increases in income? Oh, that's right, because every time we do discuss an increase in income, it just seems we get the other side of it. Oh, that means that uh, prices on supplies will increase. Prices in the supply chain, prices in the supply, uh, supply chain will increase. The costs get passed on the consumer, which they already do now, regardless of income. And for a lot of us, some of us are one or two paychecks away from basically being in poverty. And don't get me wrong, you should always learn how to save your money. Save your money, make your money work for you, I get it. But the fact that we still have inflation and that the and that the Feds or the Federal Reserve thankfully hasn't raised the rates again because it hasn't slowed down inflation at all. At the same time, income is still exactly where it is, where most folks are not earning enough for sustainable for sustainable uh for sustainable means some people taking on multiple jobs some people taking on side gigs all because there is not enough to simply go around but it amazes me so that how in the world that 60 percent of americans how does that number not alarm people to go wait a minute something's not right why are we why are we being taxed or why are we not being given enough why are we why is our rates remain the same it's amazing that that question does not get more attention. And again, I am not trying to knock the fact of saving your money. I am not trying to knock that fact of, you know, learning, learning credit and finance. I honestly think if those, if those classes were put more in public educational schools, I think that you would have a lot more fiscal responsible people. But that's just a part of the problem. You still have the problem of, you know, if you've been working at the same job and that you're everything else but your jobs income has gone up little bit of a problem that is all i'm saying but again i just find it amazing also if you're watching facebook guys i apologize because apparently mentioning anything about the war seems to be inciting violence and i and again i don't mean to go on a little mini rant about this facebook because i i see it at i see it as you guys have wanted to let me know so you facebook robots out there you ai people i just have to say this so well it is amazing to me that on social media, especially on Facebook, you can have a girl twerking and it's not a problem. You can talk about domestic violence, it's not a problem. You can talk about uh, pedophile, pedophilia, it's not a problem. You can glorify, you can glorify destruction, that's not a problem. But you're gonna sit there and tell me that if I tell people to, hey, you might wanna look more into the history behind these two countries and why they're fighting, before you just jump on any bandwagon, before you say pray for Israel or pray for Palestine, you might want to do your research because they, because again, there's a lot out there that's not being mentioned. And there's a nice little propaganda campaign that unfortunately Americans are tied to that if more people looked into it, we all would not be saying pray for Israel. And yet Facebook says that is inciting violence. I would like to know how, considering everything else that's on Facebook that incites violence, but me telling people to get informed and science violence. I know I said that we try, we try our main professionals podcast, but when it comes to Facebook, fuck them and fuck Zuckerberg. Move right along. I wanted to cover this as well because, well, I changed the first person who says this. I have to give it to George Carlin, one of my favorite comedians, God rest his soul. Because again, when I see stories like this, I wonder really about, about uh, churches and the whole idea of them getting into the pulpit. What I mean is this. Um, this in this gentleman right here, um, Bob Vander Plaats, who is the CEO of, uh, let's see where it's at, of a family leader. So he's a CEO and president. So an event, an event, and this is another thing that's going to bother me, a CEO who is a leader of a business and, endorse, and he endorses uh, DeSantis' presidential bid. Okay. Now, as an individual, no problem. I mean, like I said before, guys, it is getting to the point to where we're going to be entering the year of the presidential candidacy runs. 
And if you guys have been following this podcast, I've already told you what to expect. I told you that Tim Scott's already gone. Uh, of a, I mean, you know, Uncle Tom, Tim Scott's already gone. America's Creepiest Christian, Mike Pence, is gone. Uh, two other ones who didn't even make the debate, they're gone. So that just leaves DeSantis, Vivek Roshamshi, and Nikki Haley. Oh, and let's not forget America's favorite dark horse, which somehow seems to be seems to be somehow still in this, even though he hasn't attended a he hasn't attended a debate or anything of that matter. Donald Trump is still a part of this. So again, guys, I find it amazing that three people are all going for second place. Still, but going back to the article for a second, that again, you have these inv- these these pastors, these uh, evangelical leaders. That are coming out and throwing their support behind candidates. Here's what I say about this: regardless if it's regardless, if they're trying to support a Democrat, a Republican, or an independent. My thing is, if you are speaking on behalf of a church and decide to put your and decide to put your support behind a presidential candidate, I think we seriously need to look at your tax your tax situation. Now again, churches aren't taxed. They are seen as a uh, as a 50, uh, 503c uh, 503c uh, corporation in the eyes of the IRS, which means that they don't pay. Which means they don't pay the same tax that a normal business was, uh, business does. But in the event that you decide yourself that you want to give a political swing to whichever direction you decide to go into, I seriously think that we need to look at that because, like George Carlin said, if you want to sit there from your pulpit and decide to play politics then you should pay the price of admission and taxes just like everybody else. Because that's always bothered me. Not the fact that some churches have amassed so much money that the man would call mega churches, Joel Osteen. Um, but it's the fact of the matter is that, well, for one for one party, their conservative base is, ta- is flaunting themselves as overly uh, religious or Christian. So, of course, Christian foundations, which make their money off fleecing these people, are, of course, going to put a person there and say, Oh, we support Ron DeSantis, and DeSantis and DeSantis needs all the help he can get, considering the fact he is still not ahead of Trump. And Nikki Haley, although again a woman that's actually going to try and trying to be the leader of an all all boys club, is trying to get the nomination. I still say it's far fewer in between, but she's got a better chance than DeSantis does. And DeSantis, I keep saying, guys, is just another version of Trump that has yet to be um, caught. But I wouldn't be surprised. But again, church is coming out. Every time I say this, every time I see a church coming out and try to throw support behind somebody, this is when I sit there and I say, you know what? That's where you need to start looking at church and change its tax code and watch how quickly these churches get silent. Hey, man, don't mess with the church's money. But speaking of things about messing with people, things about things about messing with money, I think finally, finally, when it comes to George Santos, we finally might be rid of him into his conduct. Santos is facing more than 20 federal felony charges, including conspiracy, wire fraud, aggravated identity theft, and credit card fraud. Now the House Ethics Committee just released a report saying it found, quote, substantial evidence that Santos broke the law and has referred its findings to the Justice Department. ABC's Jay O'Brien has the latest from Capitol Hill. Hi, Jay. Diane, at this hour, we're learning that Representative George Santos has announced that he won't run for a second term after the release of that scathing House Ethics Committee report that details findings that the Ethics Committee says shows that Santos used campaign funds for personal reasons, funds that were given by donors to the Santos campaign that the Ethics Committee says Santos used to pay down credit card debt, to shop at stores like Hermes, to shop at stores like Sephora. They even said they they were used allegedly for quote unquote small purchases on OnlyFans as well as extensive or expensive rather hotel stays. Um, this all comes as Santos faces those federal indictments as well. Federal prosecutors making similar allegations to which Santos has pled not guilty. Now the House uh, voted previously not to expel George Santos by you need a two thirds majority to expel anyone from Congress and that threshold was not met. The last time the House voted on this, but we've heard from New York Republicans who have long been critical of Santos who have said that they are interested in bringing a resolution to expel Santos yet again. 
to the House floor in the wake of this ethics report, as well as other members of Congress who have said similar things. So the question facing George Santos at this hour is, despite the fact that he's saying he's not going to run for re-election, can he hold on to his current seat in the House after a potential another vote to expel him from Congress in the wake of this ethics report, Diane? Meanwhile, Jay, the Senate voted last night to pass a short-term government funding bill and avert a shutdown. What comes next? Yeah, and that was a late... So, yeah, let me stop right there because it's going to the government shutdown bill in which it did get passed and Congress is safe yet again for another couple of months. But George Santos, a man who we knew from Jump Street, has lied about, about campaign funding, lied about his education, lied about so many things... And now the ethics group, the ethics committee have found it all out to be true. And yes, they're trying to bring a measure up to actually boot George Santos out. Here's the problem. The Republicans, and I, and I say this, I'm just trying, I, I say this, and I'm trying to be very nice about it. I don't think the Republicans are going to boot him out. Even with the, I mean, even with overwhelming evidence, and I said this before um, many weeks ago about George Santos when the story first broke. I said, if he still found out to be guilty after this ethics committee has done their job, I guarantee, above all else, the Republicans will not boot him out. I guarantee it. Why? Because the Republicans need every vote they can get. I mean, even with their new House Speaker, even with the House Speaker, the Republicans hold a slim majority in the House of Representatives. And even with overwhelming evidence, I do not think that he will bring it to the floor to have Santos removed. Even though the Democrats are putting a motion on the floor, it is up to the House Speaker to bring it up. And again, because the Republicans have the overwhelming majority, I do not see them get I do not see them getting rid of Santos, even though Santos has said that he is not seeking re-election after this term. Gee, I wonder why. But at the same time, guys, it's one of those things where I keep saying Republicans need to stop BSing about what they're there for. They are not there for people. They are there for themselves. They are there for their party. They are there to conserve power. And if they can do so by any means necessary, that they absolutely positively will. So again, they should, we really should not be surprised by this. It's the whole idea of the fact of the matter that's that they are basically trying to keep power. And they will gladly keep Santos there, even if it is for one term. But speaking of things that are needing our attention, again, I talked about this earlier, guys. Uh, interesting article that came across that in 2024, on the Democratic side, that Biden may have a black voter problem. And the thing about it is, uh, because NBC News is the one reporting this, said that black voters, uh, I'm sorry, Biden's net approval rating among black voters has dropped nearly 20 points over the course of this year. And that some black voters feel disenfranchised because they feel like the 80, the 81-year-old president has not done anything for the black community. And again, this has been the age old issue that Democrats um, have a problem with and Republicans don't even try. What I mean by that is the minority vote because black voters um, have saved a lot of elections, specifically the one in, more recently the one in Georgia was actually saved. I mean, the Georgia, the one in Georgia turned Georgia to a blue state the one that gave Georgia its first black senator uh, in the ever recorded history. Um, and the thing about it is that was on the backs of black voters. And so, it, and, I, and I, again, I get this argument. I really do that when it comes to black voters, we only seem important around election time. And this is a stigma that, yes, even I do fight with others when I'm trying to encourage others to vote and get informed and not just, you know, not just look at two choices and go, this is all I've got. Because yes, I implore the Democratic, uh, the Democratic group out there, uh, the Democrats, their political party as a whole. Because if you think about it, that's always been the problem. That yes, you when you had Obama, you had a lot of people interested because you had a face we could relate to. You had a face that we could put to. You had a face that we can get behind. It was history making, and that every black person felt the need to do their part to get President Obama in the White House. Yes, that is true. But on the flip side of it, what are Democrats trying to push for? Because I don't see them pushing, I mean, aside from two attempts uh, during doing uh, Biden's, I like to call his uh, his liberal progressive agenda, if it makes sense. 
because Biden did try to push the George Floyd Police Reform Bill, which would have banned chokeholds, which would have banned no-knock warrants, which would have asked for immediate police reform and how things were done. But again, America's Uncle Tom, Tim Scott, killed that bill. Um, they did try to push forward um, with the former uh, with the former uh, senator's bill for voting rights. And again, that was killed. But aside from those two things that were put through, that would have that would have initially helped African Americans. African Americans are asking the same question: What more has the Democratic Party done for them? And this has always been the Democrats' problem: the outreach only seems to be outreach when it's election time. It's not around the times when African Americans are seeing more disparities, more uh, Bruce police, more brutal police attacks, uh, discrimination in the job, uh, discrimination at. Um, and schools, because we talked about the young man in Texas whose hair, um, because his hair was, I mean, his hair was an issue. And that they, you know, nothing was wrong with his hair. The school was adamant that it violated standards. Amazingly enough, this only happens with African-American kids and hairstyles that, you know, certain napkins can't have or can't really do properly. But the point I'm making out of this is when it comes to Democrats, nothing is really being done outside of outreach for voting that you're not pushing forward. I know a lot of people are sitting there saying, so so, so they should just push forward with a African-American agenda? Let me make a point. I'm just going to make this correlation, and you go with me on this. Um, we've been asking for lynching to be a federal hate crime ever since the Jim Crow era. Ever since that a rope, ever since that a rope or a burning cross outside of a black person's home was a sign of hatred, was a sign of a, of a hate crime. And for the longest time, lynching was not seen as a federal hate crime. It just became a law a year ago. Back in 2022 is where lynching finally was seen as a federal hate crime. Think about that. It took it took well over it took well over 80 plus years for lynching to become a federal hate crime. Now, at the beginning of COVID, where we didn't actually have a lot of information on COVID. And of course, Trump out there decided to say, well, it came from China, that Chinese people were carrying it. Chinese people are responsible for it, that some lab in China was studying the virus and it got out. The insinuation on Chinese people led to an attack on Chinese people getting attacked, including the U.S. So with those attacks, with those attacks happening in the U.S., what happened? There was a COVID bill that was introduced that was actually aimed at hate crimes against Chinese Americans that was passed through by both parties in record time. Again, I'm just gonna point this out. Think of the stand up, stand up, stand up to anti Semitism and Jewish hate. See how quickly those things got into motion versus, versus justice for African Americans. And you wonder, and I, and I tell people all the time, it's a little hard to argue that. It's a little hard to argue how things put in motion to protect other ethnic groups go a lot faster than protecting African-Americans. Every time that's brought to me, I have no answer for that. I have no answer for it because you know why? It is a, that is the black eye that Democrats have um, when it comes to trying to, when Trump's going to get the black vote. Because initially it was, initially, like I said, even now, um, with Biden running again for a second term, here's how they're saying it. Well, Biden's running, Trump's not in prison yet, and do you really want DeSantis, Haley, or Vivek Roshansky as president? That's how they're telling it to us. They're not sitting there saying, well, how come we can't get more protection for economic boost? How can we get more protection um, or at least more opportunities for entrepreneurs, for more STEM, for more STEM research in, in areas that have uh, low public, health, low public uh, funding and things of that nature? How can we not increase that in those areas to actually benefit those? Uh, again, so will we only benefit African-American children? Well, everything else benefits other children. And we just sitting there the whole time just going, and we're supposed to be okay with that. But when it comes near election time, oh, every, oh, every black person, please come. Please come vote for us. We need your vote. And they wonder why black people feel disenfranchised. Why some black people be like, I don't want to vote because I don't like Biden, I don't like Trump. And I cannot stress that enough. No action might as well just be a vote for the other side. 
So I say this, I say this because even though I am progressive, I never label myself as Democrat or Republican, I do stress heavily that when it comes to the whole idea of trying to really reach out to other voters, that yes, you have to address their needs. You have to, you have to let them know that if, if we're elected, this is what we're going to do. And you have to follow through with it. Simply put, do the things that you would do for other ethnic groups. It's what a lot of black people are saying outside of just showing up for election time. Pretty much. But speaking of election time, Trump's still having issues because, well, there's still a party out there that's trying to make sure he doesn't run. Even though with everything going against him right now. But you'll see what I mean momentarily. Keep Donald Trump off the ballot in 2024. A group of Republicans has brought the challenge in Colorado, arguing that the president's conduct around January 6 bar him from serving as president again. It's one of several constitutional challenges to Trump's candidacy. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has the story. Good morning, Aaron. And George, good morning to you. This is the first time a court is going to consider whether the 14th Amendment makes former President Trump ineligible to run again. The key question here is Trump's conduct on January 6th disqualifying. This morning, a group of current and former Colorado Republicans is trying to convince a judge Donald Trump engaged in an insurrection or rebellion violating the 14th Amendment as proof they played Trump's own words from January 6th. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. They showed photos of rioters outside the Capitol and video of them breaching the building. The judge heard testimony from Capitol Police Officer Winston Pinjon, who described hand-to-hand -hand combat in the halls of Congress. I was punched in the face on my left side, and I was also pushed or attacked on the right side. And before I knew it, they had knocked me on my back. And I couldn't see anything. Trump's legal team pointed to another part of Trump's speech on January 6th. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. His attorneys called the case weak. The best they have is trying to be a mini-me January 6th report. That's the best they've got. Sort of a pretty slick movie production. And that's not real evidence. That's a partisan witch hunt. The case rests on a constitutional clause written after the Civil War to prevent those who backed the Confederacy from serving in government. They've got to prove that he engaged in an insurrection in some way, and they've got to prove the legal issue, which means that by engaging in that insurrection, that automatically disqualifies him from holding the presidency. The Colorado case is the first of several similar challenges. A Minnesota case is going to be heard later this week. But Robin, it seems likely this is all destined for the Supreme Court, which will have the final say. It does. Now think about that. I have been saying that because this is not the first time the 14th Amendment, uh, this is not the first time the 14th Amendment was used to sit there and say that, yes, that uh, someone should be disbarred because they did incite insurrection against the United States. And I'm sitting here and I'm going, yeah. He literally said on video, we're going to go down here and we're going to, and we're going to stop the count. I mean, when you hear stop the count, when you hear we're going to go down to the cap, we're going to go down to the cap, we're going to go down to the Senate building and stop this. That is, in, and he incited a crowd on that day to go in there and wreck the building and put lives at risk. And I'm trying to figure out for the longest time, how is that not violating the 14th Amendment? Because that's the problem with Trump. It's like Trump is, Trump is literally... He's like that one insect that no matter how well you clean a house, that insect always finds its way back in. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, this will not go through or will happen. Again, Trump is facing multiple, multiple lawsuits on all sides. So, again, it only takes one of those federal cases to this. Uh, it only takes one um, guilty verdict from one of those federal cases to turn around and sit there and say, now, this person um, can no longer run for office, which, again, would make Haley uh, Roshansky and DeSantis very freaking happy. Because let's be honest, if Trump still sticks around through all of this, there is a strong chance he can still get the Republican nomination. And that alone should tell you everything about America. Only in America can you face multiple felonies and still somehow be president. But there's another reason why I wanted to bring up voting rights, guys, because this is something I wish got blasted a lot more on the news because, again, they are basically gutting parts 
of, of, of landmark cases. And every time they gut something, it has an immediate impact. Most importantly, the Voting Rights Act. And just recently, there was a ruling that should make us all very concerned could severely limit legal challenges under the Voting Rights Act. A federal appeals court threw out a lawsuit by an Arkansas NAACP chapter challenging a redistricting plan they say would dilute black voting power in the state. The court says only the federal government, not private citizens or groups, can bring a case like this. Let's bring in senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer, along with ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley for more. Now, Devin and, and Kim, thank you so much for joining me. Devin, what went into this decision? Yeah, Stephanie, this was a decision about who can sue to enforce the Voting Rights Act. For 40 years, individuals and civil rights groups have been able to bring challenges to voting laws, election maps that they allege have been discriminatory on the basis of race. And uh, courts uh, at all levels of the federal system have decided those cases. But here yesterday in the A Circuit Court of Appeals, a judge appointed by Donald Trump, former clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas, said that that reasoning that those that individuals and civil rights groups could bring these cases is on flimsy footing. Uh, Judge David Strauss said that, in fact, the text of the Voting Rights Act only names one person explicitly who can enforce it. That's the attorney general. Uh, he said the fact that the law doesn't name anyone else means no one else can bring a challenge to a voting law in a given state uh, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And therefore, he tossed out this challenge by the Arkansas NAACP, uh, as you said, and blocked it from going forward. Uh, and this is a major decision. If this were to stand, it would upend um, decades of, of process around the Voting Rights Act and really limit the ability uh, of individuals and civil rights groups to challenge uh, voting laws. Wow, a key part of the Voting Rights Act. Kim, what do you make of this ruling? Well, it's really bizarre, given that the United States Supreme Court just decided a case called Allen versus Milligan, in which uh, they, in a 5-4 decision, upheld a challenge to gerrymandering in another state under the same statute. So uh, on the one hand, it's a technical sort of textualist reading saying only the Justice Department can bring these cases. But on the other hand, it just ignores decades of precedent, including out of the United States Supreme Court. So it'd be weird to go to the court and say, by the way, what you've been doing is somehow illegal. Um, but it does also put pressure on the Department of Justice to start bringing more cases. And they just arguably don't bring enough. And, and Devin, as you mentioned, this could go to the Supreme Court. So what are the next steps? Well, the NAACP, Stephanie, could appeal to the full Eighth Circuit. This was just a three-judge panel of this appeals court that decided this. It was a two-to-one decision, so they could attempt to get a, a, another look at this at, at the appeals court. But uh, in any case, this is likely bound for the Supreme Court. It would likely arrive at the Supreme Court next year, which, of course, is a major presidential election year. So a lot on the line there. And we know that Justices Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch have previously indicated their openness to reconsidering the ability of individuals and civil rights groups to bring these kinds of challenges. So already two members of that court are skeptical. But as Kim was just talking about there, uh, you know, it's sort of a, a one wonders what the rest of the court will think about this, especially since just last term, as she said, and in other cases over the years, the, co the court has taken up these issues and decided them. So we'll have to see. All right. We will see. We will certainly. And again, we should be very concerned. The fact that if a organization like an organization like the NAACP can't bring up the fact that the Voting Rights Act is be you know using the Voting Rights Act, talking about these redistricting, redistrict areas that they're basically trying to cut out eligible voters from, and the fact that they're trying to sit there and say, um, they're trying to sit there and say, well, groups like yourselves can't bring that forward. Are you freaking kidding me? but only the government can. Now, of course, it did come from two judges that were appointed by Trump, so that could probably be, again, uh, brought up, and that uh, decision can be uh, can be appealed. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is our reality. And I keep pointing this out, that I'm surprised this does not get more news. And what I mean by that is that the Voting Rights Act, which is basically put in place to make sure 
to ensure to ensure the fact that our rights are protected as American citizens and the election process. And you're and you've been told by two judges that we use that and say, hey, what and let's be honest, what conservatives are doing, if we say that these conservatives are basically trying to remap or redistrict areas to where it cuts out eligible voters, and we're saying this is a violation of the Voting Rights Act, and the answer you come back and say, maybe, but you're not the ones that can bring that up and use that. I keep saying this all the time, folks. There's a reason why myself and many others out there are all saying, fight for your right to vote, to be informed, to literally be involved, because these are the things they're trying to do to make sure that you yourself do not have the right to vote anymore. But like I said, I'm pretty sure that, that a decision is going to get appealed again. It's going to get appealed, hopefully get a different ruling. But that's the things I'm pointing out right there, that you have those as judges when, they, again, and the scary part about this all is, this still may wind up going to the Supreme Court, which, again, overly conservative. I do not very high. I didn't know if it was balanced, I would feel better about it. But an overly conservative Supreme Court never spells out success for me. Considering the fact that they're the same ones that turned down Roe versus Wade, they've gutted a part of affirmative action, which I still find it's interesting that affirmative action was initially put there to help advance people of color, and at the same time taken down by five individuals who claim this who claim discrimination from an Ivy League school. I know, I know. But unfortunately, guys, there is some sad news that we have out there is that again. Another shooting, another senseless shooting. However, at this point, uh, no lot, no lot has been lost. But I feel like this is starting to become this is starting to become too mundane, especially in America. We turn now to the gunman who opened fire inside a Walmart in Ohio. It happened in Beaver Creek near Dayton, wounding four people before turning the gun on himself. Tonight, the police body camera video showing officers in pursuit through that store and what we're now learning about the possible motive. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Where's he at? Tonight, an investigation underway as authorities search for a motive and answers after a gunman opened fire inside this Ohio Walmart, wounding four people. Active shooter inside Walmart. The chaos unfolding about 8.30 p.m. Monday. Police say a man walked right into this Dayton area Walmart with a long gun. The man, later identified as 20-year-old, Benjamin Charles Jones of Dayton, Ohio, started shooting. Frantic shoppers taking cover, calling 911. He's shooting. He's shooting. He's shooting? Jones critically wounding three adults, all shoppers, another sustaining non-life-threatening injuries. We need an ambulance now. He got shot in her head or she fell and busted her head to something like there's a lot of blood. Body camera video showing officers responding, combing through the store to locate the shooter, finding him minutes later after police say he shot and killed himself. Shooter down, self-inflicted gunshot wound. And David, local authorities are now working with the FBI as they examine the suspect's background. Walmart says they are cooperating with the investigation. And again, another senseless shooting. It really is. Now, I, you know, we're not going to, like I said, not to speculate because that news will come out eventually about exactly what's going on or exactly why the gunman did this. Uh, but as of right now, we can report that there was no loss of life, um, that at this point they are still hospitalized. But there is, like I said, the only bright side we seem to find out of this, that the only life that was lost was the gunman himself, at least for now. But yeah, as that's, I mean, that's a recent story. So you can only imagine once they find out. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to speculate because these people are getting are getting firearms that really they shouldn't have. But again, we'll wait for it to come out because it's usually something. I'm just hoping there's not a manifesto. I'm just hoping there's not a manifesto or worse with this. Um, but the other story I want to get into, guys, is again with something that's a little bit closer to home, especially in Tennessee, where it's the fact that even though we're about to have Thanksgiving for a lot of us tomorrow. Um, Food and keeping our children fed has always been a problem in America. But even more so, you would think one of the richest countries in the nation, we shouldn't have that problem. And yet, we have stories like this. 
As Americans prepare to gather around the Thanksgiving dinner table, we want to shine a light on the millions of people in this country who are struggling with food insecurity. According to the USDA, more than 44 million people right here in the U.S. do not have enough food to eat or they can't access healthy food, and that includes 13 million children. And it's a problem that doesn't affect everyone equally. The nonprofit Feeding America's annual report finds that while people experience food insecurity in every community, children, seniors, and people of color are disproportionately affected. The CEO of Feeding America, Claire Babineau Fontenot, is joining us now. Claire, thank you for being here with us. And first of all, can you expand on some of these numbers? Put this into scale of the crisis that we're seeing and explain why these certain communities face it more than others. Yes. So first, thank you for having me on and for helping us lift our voice for them. So to give you context on the number you provided, 14, nearly 14 million children, 13 million, that's one in five children in this country who don't have consistent access to food. One in seven people across the country, 44 million people. And the people who are accessing the charitable food system, of which Feeding America is a major part, even more people, nearly 50 million people were forced to turn to the charitable food system in order to feed themselves and their families, including their kids. The good news is that we can do something about it. We've actually done things in the past that work. Um, we need to understand that the problem persists and we need to decide that is simply unacceptable. And it certainly cannot be ignored. Uh, last year, the child poverty rate nearly doubled to 12.4 percent after the child tax credit expansion that was part of President Biden's American Rescue Plan ended. That was in December of 2021. So explain why the problem now of food insecurity is just getting worse. Yeah, I think it can probably be a struggle for people to think about the fact that the economy seems to be doing so well. And yet, how could we have that many people with food insecure? Well, we talk to people experiencing hunger and they tell us that food insecurity is a symptom of poverty. That when they get, they might get a big promotion at work that provides them with a couple more dollars per hour in pay. And on, this, on top of that though, they had access to childcare. It goes away because now they're above the threshold for receiving childcare subsidies. Or they talk a lot about what's happening with housing prices. And then when those housing prices skyrocket, it impacts them specifically and really, really hard. You mentioned communities of color, wherever people of color live in the country, whether it be in rural America, in, in big city centers or everywhere in between, communities of color are, have to address systems that perpetuate them continuing to struggle with food insecurity at rates that are inordinate. But something that might be missed in the most recent data that I think it's really important to, to flag as well, more and more people with higher income are, in fact, food insecure today than in the past. And we really need to wrestle with the fact that, again, this is a symptom of poverty, that we need to be addressing the whole person and all the various things that impact a person's well-being. We need to do the things we know work, like child care credit, like during the pandemic, we did lots of interventions that we know helped. During the pandemic in 2021, 60 million people turned to the charitable food system for help. 38 million people identified as food insecure. Then the very next year, with additional things being put in place to be helpful, that number went down drastically. When those supports were taken away, as you might imagine, the number went back up. And in fact, the number we have now is one of the highest rates of food insecurity since they've started measuring rates of food insecurity in this country. It's just unimaginable. And you're right, you have to deal with each person with their individual needs on a unique basis. And as you know, I mean, right now it's the season of giving, right? So what is your message to people as they enter this holiday? How can they really help? Well, we always talk in terms of food, funds, and friends. Right now, the charitable food system is really being stretched well beyond its capacity. We're having to do the unthinkable, which is to turn people away because we don't have enough to provide. 
because food donations are down, because we also um, have the opportunity to provide federal commodities to people, and they're down by 48%. So I'd say go out to feedingamerica.org. There's a food bank locator on that page. Put in the zip code for the community that you care the most about. Reach out to that food bank and do the things you can to help. All right, we'll do. Good message, Claire. So on that note, I understand. I get what she's saying, that it always comes down to a few things. But whenever it comes to food insecurities, I've always said it best. It is income. It is location. It is the fact that not being done is enough. And I get all that. But I also there and say when it comes to federal funding that you have states out there that do some stupid stuff. Hence my home state of progressively backwards ass Tennessee, where they are currently, and I wish I could make this up, deciding on possibly rejecting $2 billion from the federal government that could actually help to keep kids fed in school. I wish I could make this up. What do you think? Would you or should your schools turn down $2 billion? Tennessee could be the first state ever to turn down that money from the federal government. Lawmakers say the money comes with strings attached. John Pearsos explains how this could impact your children in tonight's Eye on Education. Tennessee could be the first state ever to say no to federal education money. In this case, it's $1.9 billion. A task force is weighing that possibility this week. But to threaten to not accept it is, is in my opinion, is, I mean, and ask Tennessee taxpayers to pick up the tab is just poor policy. President of Professional Educators of Tennessee, J.C. Bowman, says that money is typically used to help low-income students students with disabilities, and fund school lunches. Bowman says teachers have serious concerns. They're afraid that if we do away with free and reduced lunch, for example, the kids aren't going to be fed. Now you're back to the problem of hungry kids, and hungry kids don't learn. Some Republican lawmakers argue the state should not accept money with strings attached and use the state's money however they choose instead. One parent of a child in Knox County thinks it's worth exploring. I do think states should be independently able to make those decisions. If the state rejects the money, it would go to other states. Tennessee would use its own money how they see fit to fill the gaps, which would be more taxpayer money. I mean, there's better ways to spend our tax money than doubling it out. Um, you know, there's a tons of things that we could use our taxpayer dollars for. The task force is watching presentations this week from various agencies related to the federal funding. In Knoxville, John Piersos, WVLT News. So what's messed up about this is, is that they have a chance. Again, $2 billion in education funding. Tennessee is one of the worst states. They are a red state. And I haven't seen this a lot on this show, that whenever it comes to red states, red states are usually the most poorest states. It, they're, they're failing in education. They're failing in liter I mean, education, literacy, um, overall skills, graduation rates. They are failing behind everything, but they're increasing in welfare and uh, in food stamp support. And I'm not just saying that's usually mostly from the napkins. The thing I'm getting out of this is, is that why are they rejecting $2 billion that could be a major boost to the educational system in Tennessee? Oh, well, it's federal, so it must have strings attached. Oh, like what? Making sure kids are fed? Making sure certain grade points are being met, making sure certain standards are being put in place. Tell me where the string is, where if it does come strings attached, it can't be anything more than that. And aside from that, it's always been the South that has always been the most hesitant to take federal assistance, unless Mother Nature comes through and all of a sudden, we can really use the help from the government. Yeah, once a hurricane or tornado has ran through your, ran through your state, now you want help, but Again, it always makes it always makes me that well, states should be able to operate independently and use their own dollars. Tennessee just, I mean, Nashville just agreed to build a nearly ten billion dollar stadium. And guess who's footing the bill? I am only pointing this out because it's amazing to me that here in Middle Tennessee, that you can build an entertainment center, a stadium, destroy said stadium, build a new stadium, build a convention center, build an amphitheater, build a park, tear down a park. Build a soccer field, which, by the way, was funded not by the city, but by uh, through its own crowdsourcing. So that's an exception. 
But the thing, but the fact of the matter is, guys, states, states saying that they can use their own state's dollars, that alone is kind of scary, especially when it comes to those states who have who are basically red states that are fiscally that are definitely not fiscally responsible with handling state funds. I am just pointing that out. But yet they still decide. I'm just I would, I would like to think that cooler heads would prevail with the Tennessee state legislature, but again, I'm concerned because they're really going to turn down 2 billion dollars that can go a long way in education, but swear up and down there must be a there must be a strings attached to this. And that's why a lot of them, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm a, I'm a parent that has a child in school in Tennessee. It would benefit them greatly. And at the same time, I don't see the downside in saying, of why not? But that's just me. But another story, guys, that we should know about is that the New York uh, Benevolent, uh, how can I put this out? The Police Benevolent Association of the City of New York and 60 other law enforcement unions we're challenging the chokehold ban that was being put into law by uh, at, uh, at New York. Thankfully, the New York State Court of Appeals upholds the bans on chokeholds um, for good reason. They're chokeholds. Now, again, guys, this does stem from Eric Gardner. This does stem from George Floyd and others who were killed uh, in police custody. So, again, chokeholds have never seen to me because... Let's just be honest. Chokeholds are usually put in place by very oversells law enforcement that don't know when they need to let go. At the same time, they have led to deaths or grave injury. So again, I keep saying this all the time: policemen have police out there with law enforcement because there definitely doesn't be law. There needs to be uh, re, uh, law enforcement reform in America. And I think to myself: a uh, police officer has backup, taser, mace, and restraints. Keep in mind, you have. At least three items that are considered non-lethal, but they always go to the chokehold. The chokehold, which again can suppress, can suppress a target. It can also kill a target in a matter of seconds. And again, it amazed me so that when it comes to police unions and law enforcement groups out there, they're like, oh no, we, we need this. Tell me why do you need a tool to subdue a suspect that can end up that can wind up ultimately killing them? I don't blame the Court of Appeals for holding this up because it seems like law enforcement is going to do a lot more to prove why they need this chokehold maneuver. And that time they fell short and I'm happy about it. But speaking of things, guys, we're going to be a little sad to talk about the next story again. The story that we have covered here on how the Frank got here because, again, a woman finally got to bury her son after finding out her son, um, who she reported missing, was killed by a law enforcement officer in a hit and run and yet was buried in a pauper's field, and no one for the longest time notified her about that. That alone is every parent's worst nightmare. Tonight, a mother's anguish turning to anger. <laughs> Betterson Wade thought she'd finally get some peace of mind, working with Hinds County, Mississippi officials to exhume the remains of her son, Dexter, who was killed and buried without her knowing. But public works officials went ahead with the plan hours before she arrived. I didn't get to see him come from the ground. Okay, cover up. I mean, y'all keep telling me y'all didn't do it unintentionally. This is not an intention to me. But how? If this is y'all child, what would y'all think? Her son's remains had already been dug up and put into a body bag. Wade says the county made her feel like she doesn't exist and that it didn't matter she's a mother looking to honor her son. The Public Works Department did not return a request for comment. She had to fight for transparency just to get to this point. And even though it's emotional, she ain't no ways tired for us. It's almost a funeral in reverse. Wade had filed a missing persons report in March, only to find out six months later her son had been struck and killed by an off-duty Jackson police officer while crossing a highway. He was then buried in an unmarked grave behind the county jail. Only thing I could say, this I tried to find you and I could. I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry you are here. Jackson police have not responded to NBC's questions about the case. But according to the coroner's office, an investigator did identify Dexter and shared contact information for his mother with the police. But Betterson says she never got a call. At no point have we identified or did any investigation reveal 
that there was any police misconduct in this process and that there was any malicious intent. The premature exhumation, another insult for a grieving mother. And as her attorneys see it, a situation that now makes it impossible to know the condition in which Dexter's remains were buried. And it begs the question about all those other unknown bodies in that graveyard. How many of those families that think their loved ones are missing? <laughs> We're going to get to the truth, oh not just for your son, but for other children. All right. With that, Maura Barrett joins us now live in the studio. So, Maura, I, my question is, because we, we don't really know this. I, I don't know if we know this yet. There was an off-duty officer who hit that man who sort of led to all this. Do we know if that person has been investigated? Are they charged? Do we even know their name? Well, as of right now, all that we do know is that the officer was off-duty at the time all of this unfolded. I called the city and the police department looking for clarification on whether the officer is still employed, what that status is, and whether or not this could be involved as part of the larger federal investigation that the family is calling for. We still, like you said, don't know who this officer is. Now, as for next steps for the Wade family. Their attorneys are setting up an independent autopsy and are planning a funeral for next week. So to be clear, we called, we try to figure out who this off-duty officer was to see how this whole thing happened, and we've gotten nothing so far. No details yet. Okay. Isn't that kind of interesting? That's interesting. So let me get this straight. A woman, a mother, files for a missing, for a missing report on her son. Her son is hit by an off-duty police officer. The son is also buried in the field. The mother is not in the mother is not informed for several months until someone at the police department finally decides to let her know where her son is. Then she has to do all this stuff to get the body exhumed and finally give it a proper burial. And then having the mayor cover the butts of the law enforcement. And now the officer in question, nobody can't seem to get a hold of him or find out who that person is. How is this not over? This this seems like a big ass cover up. A very big cover up because again, an off duty officer hits someone and kills them. I know if it was civilian, you would have their name, you would have their name before they were in jail. But whenever it comes to law enforcement, I keep bringing this up. It's just strange that law enforcement seems to have this explanation for everything. Oh, well, it was just an oversight error. Okay, that means that whoever was over it said people, whoever was the person, it's that person was in charge. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be. And you and you feel for that mother because all she wants is the truth. But she also wants justice. The person that took her son's life is still out there and more than likely still, still working in law enforcement. But why is he getting more protection than the actual victim themselves? That's my question. And again, that's a question that really does need to be asked when it comes to law enforcement. Why are, get, why are they giving quantum immunity? Why are they always giving the benefit of the doubt? Why is it always on their side? They get the more presumed innocent till proven guilty than the people that they arrest. And again, the mayor, in my opinion, might as well be gutless because he's going to sit there and say, well, everything, every, we've, tried to, we've tried to establish uh, transparency. Every time I hear that, it's like, a, it's like a corporate buzzword that just gets annoying. Because transparency, being transparent is not that hard. It's the fact that when the police are at fault for something, they have to make it to the point to where, oh, we can get out of this if we do said if we do said step. But again, I keep saying police reform, police reform needs to change, penalization for officers that are simply not up to snuff, using the police pension as a way of repaying back the families and victims of those families would curb this overnight. That is all I'm saying. But moving forward, in other words, you know, as far as us getting not getting justice, Breonna Taylor, the uh, officer that was basically um, being put on trial for federal crimes. Well, the judge declared a mistrial. Yes, I said it. I'll in the latest attempt to try to hold Louisville officers accountable for the death of Breonna Taylor. We're talking about Brett. Hankison. He's a former officer who fired shots into Taylor's home during a botched raid back in 2020. He was facing federal civil rights charges of excessive force.
But the judge has now declared this mistrial after the jury deadlocked, apparently, on these charges. NBC's Shaquille Brewster is following this one for us here. So, Shaq, explain what happened here and what this means for the case going forward for the folks who wanted to see Hankison held responsible for what he did that night. Well, Holly, to answer that second part of the question, this means that we could see an entirely new trial to come. The judge setting a hearing for about a month from now to, to, to determine the exact next steps in this trial. But let's step back. This is the federal case against one of the officers involved in that March 2020 raid, as you mentioned, against Brianna Taylor. Uh, the, you know kind of the fact pattern there where her boyfriend said they feared a break in. They heard a, a noise at the door in the overnight hours in March of 2020 uh, when police Police busted in. Her boyfriend fired one shot, hitting an officer. Now, Hankinson, while he didn't shoot Brianna Taylor, uh, prosecutors allege that he essentially acted recklessly, that he uh, used excessive force because he then went to a window and a sliding glass door that were covered, they say, by blinds and a curtain, and then fired 10 shots into not only Brianna Taylor's apartment, but also the apartment of her neighbors that included a young family. Uh, Hankinson uh, was on trial for. Uh, uh, the similar action in state charges uh, just earlier this year. He was, or excuse me, uh, earlier last year, he uh, was acquitted in that case. And now uh, a jury deadlocked on whether or not he violated both the civil rights of Breonna Taylor and her boyfriend, but also the family in that neighboring apartment alley. It's crazy. A mistrial because the jury could not come to a decision. The jury was deadlocked. And so it was mistrial was taken out. And if you're probably wondering, yes, it was a jury of nearly all white people because Lord knows they wouldn't put him in a jury full of all black people. That would be the easiest conviction on record timing. But it does mean that another case will be brought up um, if prosecutors decide to move forward. But I think it's just, it is honestly to me crazy that Breonna Taylor, um, it's been three years Three years, and this case still is not getting the justice it should have gotten. For a no-knock warrant, for cops going in and shooting first, but having, they try to say, oh, well, they shot at us. Well, shoot, if you came into my house and unannounced, and I have a gun, and I lawfully own the gun, and you're coming in my house with my family, yeah, I'd shoot too. I would shoot too. At the same time, those very same officers seem to be well for lack of better words not being not, not being held accountable even though the officer is still he's he's, not, he's a former officer of louisville pd but thanks to him and daniel cameron who decided not to prosecute you know it took the department of justice to try to bring this forward and even then a jury of his own peers still couldn't find a way to convict him and yet they tell us to be patient about getting justice speaking of other things that require justice Imagine that you've seen a video of a man deciding to punch a woman that's already restrained on the ground by several other officers, and they try to explain it away. And unfortunately, this isn't make-believe. That's another story that happened. Benning says he understands this is a sensitive matter and people want to see the full body cam video to get a full picture of what happened here. Chief Jennings says the public deserves full transparency in this case, and that's why CMPD has already filed a petition with the court, which is required here by law in North Carolina to release the video. I understand the outrage. I understand the uh, emotions that come when you look at a video that involves an officer who is punching a female. Who Outrage over this video showing a woman getting punched several times by a CMPD officer during an arrest in South Charlotte on Monday. Police say it all happened when officers tried to arrest Christina Pierre and a man caught smoking marijuana at a bus stop. CMPD says they both resisted and during the struggle, Pierre hit an officer several times. Police say she was then taken to the ground. It is a compliance blow, a strike to the peroneal nerve is if someone is has their hands underneath them and we're trying to activate an arrest, uh, that strike to the peroneal nerve. While CMPD says their officer hit Pierre in the legs, we received these photos showing bruises and scratches to her face. Uh, there was a struggle with a, a single officer that occurred before his backup did arrive. Uh, we think that if um, if those ab ab abrasion or bruising on her face occurred, it would have occurred during that struggle at some point. 
Chief Jennings says the body camera of that officer identified as Vincent Pistone was knocked off during the struggle. So it's hard to get a clear picture of the altercation between the two. However, Chief Jennings says the department plans to comb through every piece of video to make sure all of the steps taken were right. He also says he will use this as a teaching moment to take a look at where they can make improvements as an agency. It's a check and balance. Greg Jackson with Heal Charlotte says he appreciates. I think a lot of the policies need to change. And the fact that he's brought that to the table and he's, he's addressed that himself just opens up the opportunity to bring it to the table and have more conversations about it. NAACP president for the Charlotte branch, Corinne Mack, calling for accountability. There is no reason for five men to hold down one woman. There's no reason for one of those men to be punching a person or kneeing a person. Mayor Lyles asking the public to have patience as they review the incident completely. I hope that um, we have earned enough trust in this community that they can wait for us to take all of the information, put it together and assess it and decide what's next. The officer who hit Pierre was reassigned as the investigation continues. And as far as the video goes, well, it could take months before it is released. In Uptown. And again, I would have to ask this question. And I had that question because the NAACP president said it. Five men hold down one woman, but yet you see one man just striking them. What other reason would you have? Well, well, it, it, it always kills me. It always kills me how you have uh, the police chief, uh, the commander there, was, was explaining it away. He tried to explain, well, he was trying, you know, when you hit a certain coronal nerve, it opens them up. And, you know, when trying to indicate an arrest, you're telling me five of your officers can't take down one woman? Five assault trained officers can't take down one woman without basically beating her. I'm sorry, that's some weak sauce, if I ever did see. And even more so, you have, and again, and this is the problem I have with the police. This is the, this is the overall problem that I have. It's just that whenever the police are always caught in the wrong, they need all this time. We need to investigate. We need to look at the video. We need to look at this. So I sit there and say, okay, so they're all said and done, and the officer's in the wrong. Will the officer be fired? Will the officer be blacklisted? Will the officers that also held said woman down while said police officer did strike her, will they also be blacklisted? Will they also be brought up on assault charges? Will they be tried to the full extent of the law? Because if they're not, then all you're pretty much telling us is lip service. Because, again, there is no excuse why five men holding down a woman and yet one needs to strike her in order for them to subdue her. And at the same time, this is all over marijuana? You decided to take somebody over marijuana. And another reason why marijuana should might as well just be uh, might as well just be legal and tax because, again, when it comes to law enforcement, there always seems to be an overabundance of excessive force. But leave it to those, especially in the mayor's office, the police chief, and everyone else will try to explain it away. And this is why I keep saying until certain things are put in place, actual reform may not happen. We're going to go ahead and move on, guys, for our feel good segment. That's usually how the fact we got here. We usually cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom. Sometimes it makes you lose your faith, humanity. But hey, it's tomorrow. tomorrow. It's Wednesday. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. And really quickly, uh, whether or not you do Thanksgiving, Friendsgiving, or it's just a reason to get together, hopefully you guys can do so with your family, your loved ones, people you care about, to maybe take the day. And if you are working, please may your shift be quick and safe. And if you're not, enjoy the day with your loved ones. Find something to be thankful for, to be grateful for. That's the whole thing about Thanksgiving, not just because of the fact that, well, pilgrims decided to kill the Indians after they saved them. But that's a whole other part of history we're not going to talk about right now, although we should. The thing about Thanksgiving is, guys, take the time to spend it with your loved ones. Enjoy some turkey or, or, or non-turkey if you're vegan and some football if you're into that. Um, if not, enjoy the wonderful streaming services that are out there. But again, take the time to be with your loved ones and enjoy the day if you can. That also being said, guys, we want to leave you out with some feel-good vibes and hope this story will do it because this is involving a pair of Eagle fans because, let's be honest, we see those people out there in various areas that are always trying to hand you something. Well, 
these two ego fans decided to take something that someone was handing out, and let's just say it changed their entire day of going to watch an Eagles game. Hopefully, it'll bring you some joy because it definitely did for me. You want me to order you one of those? Uh, you won the grand prize. What's so yeah. there's sideline passes. If you want to come and watch the warm up on the sideline, I can take you guys down there right now if you want to come. Go. Right now? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh my God! Uh, God bless you. Oh my gosh, of course. What's your name? Marie. Terrence. Nice to meet you. <laughs> 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 We were talking about the sideline We were. We were. We were saying, who are these people down there? How did they get down there? People oh. just like you. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is great. Ladies and gentlemen, the real Garden of Eden right here. <laughs> here. God, this is great. So we see them like, like live. Yeah. No, no, I'm on the sideline. Not just at the game. I'm on the sideline. Cynthia, you'll never believe where I am. I am on the sideline. On the no, side. I'm line. not in the seat. I'm on the sideline. <laughs> and again, I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, because you never know, like I said, not, ex not accepting something guys, um, which they did because again, you don't know what people are giving you, but it's nice to see some people enjoy some sideline passes and get to watch their team and, and just have fun, spread joy, nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, that's going to do it for this podcast, guys. I do thank you all for watching, for liking, for letting people is live and also at Facebook. Um, just because again, we did not encourage violence. We did not encourage to say F Israel or F Palestine, we said none of that. All we said was educate yourself on the history of those two countries and then understand because it is way too easy to see support, you know, you know, support, uh, support Jewish, stop Jewish hate or, you know, free Palestine or anything in the above. Before you jump into the hashtag pool, do your research. That's all we're saying, Facebook. But again, I digress. We were showing on other platforms on YouTube, uh, on YouTube and on Twitch. So again, thank you all guys who are listening and watching and still commenting. Still, I certainly appreciate it. So shameless plug before I do get out of here, guys. I do want to start with my buddy Vaughn at Big BZA Dot. You can definitely find him, Big BZA Dot, on all social media. He does beats for shows, for music, things of that nature. Or if you just need a custom beat, definitely check him out, Big BZA Dot, on all social media. Uh, aside from that, guys, I did want to bring up something else that I'm glad that I'm a part of and that I also want you to understand this first because I know I just got to talk about streaming services. Um, we noticed that Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, things are disappearing, content's dropping and being re-added, but the prices are going up because why? They're effing greedy, that's why. And I said to myself, I would like to have a different streaming service that's really more blurred themed than people of color. Well, look no further, guys, because BlurredStation.com has arrived. Um, as you can see there, guys, at BlurStation.com, it is a POC and uh, Blurred-centric uh, for sci-fi, horror, noir, fantasy, superhero, anime, and action entertainment. As you can see, there were Blood Emblem, Atwood, and the Undead Horizon, just to name a few. Again, this service, guys, is $10.99 a month. $10.99 a month. You can still get this service and at the same time still be able to get something to eat. Always definitely a wonderfully accepted. At the same time, guys, if you ever be so inclined, definitely click to the Join Now button. And when you get to Join Now under Membership Subscriptions, if you would select Blurred's Eye View Affinity Membership for me, and then from there, um, yeah, under, Influity, um, under uh, Affinity Influence Partner, you can select anybody there. You can select myself, Black Spartan, or Chris Fury, Room Full of Blurreds. We'll be watching Safari TV, Navy Montel, or Geek by Heart. Um, it definitely helps us because, again, we are definitely big people behind this, and we want to move this forward. Now, you're probably wondering, 1099 Affinity Membership, what does that mean? Well, after 36 months of paying 1099, you guys could actually own a piece of BlurStation.com. You know how you always want to own a piece of Netflix, of Amazon, of Apple TV, but you didn't want to go on places like uh, you want to go places like E-Trade. You didn't want to go on places. Um, 
like Fidelity Investments and have to spend a crap ton of money just to get one share. Well, here it's ten ninety nine a month for thirty six months, and you two could own a piece of a, a blur station without going through all the trades. And again, this is something that is created for us, by us, for us to enjoy. So let's make it bigger. Let's promote it. Let's share it. And again, going back to the whole thing, don't just like the content. Share it. Let people know about it. Let us use word of mouth. Word of mouth is the greatest counter weapon against the algorithm. Because as my friend, a room full of birds, would, a room full of birds would say, "F the algorithm." That being said, guys, of course you can find me, uh, Black Box Four Four Seven, all the socials. I usually do reviews with everything that I read, that I watch, that I play, and gym stuff. Because I do a couple push-ups. The link at the bottom has been tickering, and they made just a little bit bigger for you guys to see. If you copy and paste that link into your browser, it'll take you to my YouTube, Facebook groups for all of my podcasts. How the fact we got here, get bit of course off this podcast. Definitely like, definitely share, definitely subscribe. Let people know. Um, let people know about all this because, like I said, it's all about sharing. It's all about really connecting and really pushing forward. Always the word of mouth has always been the biggest thing. Um, aside from that, guys, um, I keep saying this: the presidential election is coming up next year. Please be informed. Please know your candidates, not just not just your national candidates, but your local and state candidates. They may have elections coming up as well because after the presidential election comes the midterms. Again. Get involved. Know your candidates. Know if they stand for your issues. Because, again, we're so used to this whole thing of choice A or choice B. But, again, not knowing about that can lead to improper choice. And definitely no action of voting. Mine's will be a vote for the other guy. That's how Trump got elected in the first place. So, uh, with that being said, guys, last thing I'll say about how the friend got here, it's all about staying informed. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. We are simply giving you all the information, allowing you to make up your own mind. But we do provide a logical perspective that goes along with it. We do a lot better as a society once we're informed. We're progressive. We move forward. We try to right the wrong for our past by making decisions now that we should have done back then, like electing our first black woman to the Supreme Court, electing our first black woman to the Board of Governors, electing our first black woman as a national cybersecurity advisor. All great things. When we don't learn from history, that's when we are doomed to repeat. That's when we keep asking ourselves, why did everything go up on our paycheck? Why are we electing different politicians in Congress, but still the same old games being played there? And most importantly, how the crap we got here. Thank you all for watching, guys. Have a great Thanksgiving, Friendsgiving, or Festivus for the rest of us. Um, spend some time with your loved ones. Get some peace. Get your mind right. And if you're working, may your shift be short, but that paycheck be great. Take care of yourselves and each other, guys. I'm out of here. Peace.